So I'd like to call the meeting to order now at 1030. And if you'll just pray with me first. Gracious Lord of all, we give thanks to you for all that you have seen us through throughout the years. In particular, the work, the joys, the fellowship, the caring and sharing, all that has transpired in this building and beyond. You know our struggles and our hearts. Lord, we ask you to help us hear your voice throughout this meeting as we listen and share our thoughts with one another. In the name of your son, Jesus, who rose from the dead to give us eternal life. Amen. Amen. So before I get started, I want you to know that um, Pastor Carrie Call is going to be here. She's not coming till 11, though, so I hope that that's in enough time, because it is only 1034. But anyway, she's coming. Um, and she will be here to answer some questions, as you'll see a little bit later. Um, so if those of you who might not remember, Carrie Call is our conference minister. Yeah, I'm sorry, I should have said that. So, and she was with us back in January, and now she'll be here again with us. Okay, so the first thing um, on the agenda is the bylaws. And you might remember that we suspended our bylaws back in 2022 when we um, worked on our restructuring. So we suspended them. Now that we have the structure as sort of a, um, a hybrid, we have part of the, the old consistory and the administrative team, and so that's the new structure that we have now. So now we're ready to redo the bylaws. And there were some things that were very out of date as well. So there was a team of Mike Landis, and Flora and Pastor Libby, who worked on this very hard. Hopefully you, you all received the new bylaws, so you've had maybe a chance to look at them. And if you got them by email, you also saw the old bylaws with the scratched out parts that we changed. So I'm gonna turn that over to Mike. It's been quite some time since we last reviewed the bylaws. And as you may or may not know, um, Consistory and Pastor Libby met with uh, Carrie Call a while back just to get some options, uh, some advice as we move forward with the future of the church. And one of the things she advised was that it was important that we had up-to-date bylaws in place. <clears throat> Consistory felt that in light of the multiple, multiple reorganizations of the church leadership structure alone, it was important we again review the bylaws to ensure they met legal requirements for our nonprofit status use more contemporary language and quite simply reflected who we are today. Thus, Consistory undertook the task of rewrite, rewriting the by, bylaws and proposing changes to our existing bylaws. As near as we've been able to determine, the last two reviews of the bylaws took place uh, October 29th, 1989 and July 16th, 2017. <clears throat> In going about reviewing and making proposed changes to the bylaws, we utilized model bylaws that were provided by the conference, uh, and we used those for guidance. As Carol has stated, myself along with Pastor Libby and Flora Paulos used the most recent version of our bylaws, the July 16, 2017 version, and went through each one, each provision line by line, comparing uh, again, each provision with the model bylaws, and we made proposed changes we felt were needed. This was done over a number of Zoom sessions. When we had completed that task, we shared the work with the full consistory and with Carrie Call. Carrie felt the bylaws were well written, as did consistory who approved them. So you were sent two copies. One is the bylaws showing all the changes, the deletions, the additions of language, and, and so forth. You also re received a, a clean copy uh, that reflects the, the bylaws we'd like you to vote on today. So I will make a motion that the bylaws be approved. Once we have a second, then we can open it up for discussion. I make a motion that we accept these new bylaws as written. We have a, a motion and a second. Um, are there any questions? Any discussion? All in favor? of accepting the bylaws as you have, as written? Say aye. 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 Or raise your hand, I guess, maybe. Aye. Okay. Any opposed? 
There's always one. <laughs> okay, the motion carries, and the bylaws, our new bylaws, our revised bylaws, are accepted. Thank you for your work. Do you have anything else you wanted to say? No. All right, thank you for your work, for, and Flora, for yours as well. <laughs> okay, so next is just something that I'd like to touch on very briefly. Um, apparently, there are some people that are still talking about a situation where one of our staff had, had resigned. And, and there were some things going around about that. And as with most situations, there are one side of the story kind of gets more attention. But there are always multiple sides of the story. But without knowing the whole story, I'm asking that those of you that are still bringing this up, trust the leadership that we have done what we think is best for the whole congregation. And hopefully put this to rest because I think it's of no value to anyone or to our church to keep rehashing partial information. As a reminder, I want to let you know, which I've mentioned several times, that we do have a committee, a relatively new committee, but they are up and running for, um, it's called Pastoral Support Committee. And um, Marilyn is on that, and Lynn, and um, Steve Hornwater. So if you have some questions, you know, please take it to them. So thank you for that. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about um, the update for what we've been looking at for the next steps for our church, which is what Carrie's coming for if we still are here. <laughs> um, so if you remember in, in October, most of you attended a, a meeting and a celebration that we had in the, in the chapel. So we, it was an anniversary celebration and it was a, an important meeting that we had and we talked about what we might do, what steps we might take for the future. And, you know, we, we had lots of good input. It was very well attended. And we came away with the, with the thought that the majority of people wanted to at least look at the idea of merging with another church. But we asked Carrie, Pastor Carrie Call to come in in January, and she met with the consistory in January. And we explained our, you know, our whole situation, and she said this is so common, unfortunately, that um, UCC churches and other mainline churches are, are shrinking and losing members and having to do various things to, to keep going. So she gave us th the names of three churches that she thought f that were close by, first of all, and that she thought might be very interested in the possibility of a merger. And so those churches were, um, or are Trinity in East Petersburg, Church of the Apostles, and Salem Roarstown. So um, Mike and Frank Geiger, Frank uh, and Mike Landis and I, went to visit all three of those churches. We went together, so we all saw the same thing and so that we could kind of get an idea and, and talk. So the, the interesting thing was that all three of us felt the same at each place. You know, we felt... We, we were just blown away at Salem. Yes, Lynn. At Salem, um, there were about 35, 35, I think, 35, 40 at Salem. I think so. I had talked to one of the, they call it not consist for council, and described our basic membership makeup, and they're pretty much reflect what we are. Um, I was really impressed them with what they're all doing. I mean, it's a very active time. It's a smaller sanctuary, so it doesn't feel, you know, quite as sparse. Um, it's very different. I mean, it, the sanctuary is, you know, like ch churches sometimes are, a little bit more um, traditional, that's all. Ornate, yeah, a little more ornate, too. Which isn't, you know, ours is not, very, not ornate, so it doesn't take much to be more ornate, but it, but, <laughs> but, but it, is, it is ornate. Um, okay, so, I'm, I want to let you know that this is just an ex exploratory 
We are not planning to do anything you know, quickly, it will not, and nothing will happen this year. We are not saying that we are definitely going to merge with anybody. This is just the first step to see what's out there, what are the possibilities. Um, and so when we came home from all three of those, I contacted Carrie. And so she said she would contact, she, was, she sounded excited, you know, that we picked, or that we, our first choice anyway was, Salem. So she contacted them and got back with me, and um, she said the next step would be for our consistory and their council to go out to dinner, and she would be there, and she would facilitate a conversation. So we would, you know, get a chance to meet each other. We would get a chance to talk about values of the church and, and whatever, but she would be there to facilitate that. And then whenever this happens, and she has some dates that are fairly soon, um, so it won't be a long time. And then we would come back, of course, and share with you what we found. Um, and I don't really know any more about other steps or anything. That's why she's coming. So I can't answer a lot of questions, I don't think. But I do want to make sure that you understand that we're not just like, okay, we go, we meet, we're going to merge, you know, by the end of the year. That's not going to happen. We will work through whatever it is that we, whatever it is that we decide, and it might not be a merger, it might be something else. This is just the first step of this particular exploration. And, and you know, you, you will, everyone will be involved. It's not something the consistory is going to decide or anything. It will be, we will bring this every step of the way so that you are informed and can vote and can think about it and pray about it. And, you know, I mean, Everybody might not get their way, I can't assure that, but um, we want you all to at least have your input and have time to get used to it. Yes, Eleanor. I'm just wondering whether any of the three churches have a significant number of young families and children, or are they kind of in the same spot? Not, not a lot. Um, there was no real presence of children. I mean, the majority of the people were older. I will definitely tell you that. In all three churches, the majority of them are older. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sue. You had said um, you were talking about them being active churches. Did you get a chance to look at the types of small group or other activities any of the churches have? No. Okay. We, we certainly will. Yeah. Um, and that will be something probably that, you know, that might be part of the discussion initially. I don't know. We do know that they have a very active outreach program. Yeah, because they, they did mention that right away. I think probably the guy that first addressed or uh, met us was on that committee. And that's probably why, because that's the very first thing he talked about. All the soup they had. Mike, Mike said they should be giving out blood pressure medicine <laughs> with the soup. They had canned soup. I mean, just tons of canned soup. <laughs> He goes, I hope they give that with blood pressure medicine. <laughs> so, and they collect something every month. And so, yeah, so they're, they're very active. And I think that's the person we talked to. So that's, you know, but I don't know the other. I do know they were doing some other activities. They were having a tea, I believe. Wasn't that a tea they were having? Which, the, one of the announcements that they do every year, they said it was very popular last year. And now they're having another one. So that's an activity they do. I don't know anything at this point about any other small group. So, and that's a very good question. And we'll make sure that we ask them that. Yeah. So any other questions that I might be able to answer? I, right now, yeah, it's five of, she might be here. If we, I, I, if there's no other questions, I will move on, which I don't have too much to say about the last thing, which is Pastor Libby's, um, uh, sabbatical because she put a lot of information in the in the newsletter so I don't know that there's much else I have to say um, so pastor let me our bylaws I guess say that that a pastor is earns a sabbatical after five years of service well she has been here seven years but didn't feel really that she could take it after five years with COVID and everything so um, 
so she has earned her this sabbatical. <clears throat> and I read up on sabbaticals, especially church ones, and they're, they really feel they're very, very important for, for pastors to be able to have time away and to rest and kind of rejuvenate it. You know, being a pastor is, is a very, there's so much given as a pastor um, that, they, that pastors need time to kind of to rest and get some of that energy back. So, yeah, she'll be gone three months. But she said most of it in the newsletter, so I don't really have anything new to say. Oh, other than, um, if you remember last year when she was on vacation, we had Pastor Katie, and we all seemed to like her, the people I heard, and she's the one that's going to be filling in. So that's the same one that we had last year, uh, Pastor Katie Court, I believe. And, um, and so I think, now when she did it before, she just did the sermon. But I'm, and I did the rest of it, and that's not my idea that, <laughs> that I'm doing that for three months. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure she's doing everything. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, are there any other thoughts about it? Even if there aren't, you know, questions about the, the process, are there thoughts when you're listening to me? Are you thinking, you know, that sounds like a good thing, that's... You know, I don't think we're ready for that. Anything that you want to share, Dave? I, I would make a comment about the sabbatical. Just, you know, in, in terms of um, I I've, I've done the sabbatical. Okay, well, I did ask Libby a little bit about that because, as I say, the last time she was here, she was pretty clear that she just wanted to do the sermon, which is why I did the rest of the stuff. Uh, and I said, she's going to do more than just the sermon, isn't she? <laughs> and she said, yes, you know, she would. I, and I, like you said, it's sort of a negotiation that, you know, between the cost or, the, you know, the, the fee that they're getting and the responsibility. But I'm pretty sure she doesn't have any other calling right now, so, so she has time, I believe. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we did, we did talk about it a little bit, but I don't really know enough to say exactly what she's going to do. She is going to be here once a week. I mean, I think about all the stuff that Libby does and how, how would, you know, she, she does a lot during the week. So, but that is, and I think more mostly between Libby and, and Pastor Katie. Um, and maybe there'll be some helping out with people visiting. You know, I, I don't know. I don't know that. It is until July, so there's, there's a lot of, you know, for us to learn before it actually occurs. But those are all good things. And hopefully, Libby's very um, detail-oriented. She, she will not leave any ends untied because she, she will figure out everything that needs to be done. She is very, she's that way. So I'm sure that it will. Yes, Linda. Yes, we have been saving through the years for this. Yes, we have. Good question. Yeah. Yeah. Do the other three churches have a preschool? Yes, I think they all do, actually. Oh, I want to, the other thing I wanted to say is that when I, and I'm imagining this is the same that uh, Mike and Frank, when I was there at each church, I, was also, I wasn't just thinking about how do I like this church. I was thinking how would our, you know, I know everybody pretty well here, and I was thinking how would you all like this service, you know. And, um, you know, obviously I can't totally speculate, but I, I did try to think, you know, how would the people of our congregation like this environment? Yeah, Anne. That comment makes me wonder about the, the merger. Is the working assumption that we would join that church 
as opposed to them joining our church. So they're not looking for merger. We're the ones who are looking right. for Right. That's right. Yes. Yeah, I mean, we have... Yeah, we are the ones that are, are, I mean, not that, well, what do you say? We are the ones that, because we are spending so much of our endowment fund to just pay the bills, are looking, and we have a big church that's bigger than we need, a big whole building. Um, and of course, if we did have someone come here, that would help with all those things. But that is, that is the thought, yes. They are not looking to move or to... They are happy when I talked to Pastor Kerry, she said they were thrilled that we were thinking and, you know, kind of chose them as our first one. They were very happy about it. They would love to do that, but they are not, they are not looking for that. So yes, the thought would be we would leave here and they're calling a new pastor. So they are not thinking of moving anywhere. Yeah, they're in the process of calling. So I heard you so, you said, and so. Well, just in, the, in all of the comments that I've already made, I, just wanted, I was just wanting to add that as I was there, I was not thinking, how do I like this church? Um, I was thinking, how would everyone like this church? The best that I can. You know, I'm thinking of individual people and, you know, knowing what I've heard from people, um, comments that I've heard, I, that's, I was trying to look at that as well. And is just what I've already said, though. I mean, and I loved Salem, even though I had no expectations. I, I just went there thinking, oh, you know, nothing. I had nothing. So you're saying that the three, three problems we have felt in Salem. Yes, yes. I guess that maybe is the and that you were looking for. <laughs> um, it is very different in this church. So, I mean, that's the only thing. If, this, if you love this sanctuary, it is a very different sanctuary. It, oh, is she here? Oh, good. Good, because I'm running out of jokes to tell. <laughs> so, yeah. And certainly, um, you know, you're free to go to the church, you know, to just on a Sunday go, go to church there, you know, so you would, you would see what you think about it anytime. So, you know, that's, a, that's an option. Um, so where, if you don't know where it is, if you go north on uh, Roarstown Road to Marietta, if you turned right, you would... Uh, uh, half a, well, probably a quarter of a mile at the most, you would get to Church of the Apostles. If you turn left, going toward Columbia, you get to Salem, Roarstown. Um, a big stone's throw that direction. It's, it's kind of across from, there's another church that, well, I don't know if it's across from that or if it's across from that white church that's there. Some other church. But anyway, it's, it, you can't miss it. It's, if you drive west on Marietta Avenue, it's on the left side. Okay, so good morning, everyone. I apologize for my tardiness. I had 11 on my calendar, <laughs> so um, I should have known that service would end and you'd go right into it. So I apologize. Um, glad to be with you. And I'm wondering just at this moment, given what you've heard from Carol, how everybody is feeling or what your first thoughts are or what you're thinking about. I mean, has this come as a surprise to most of you? Is there a sense of discomfort? Anybody want to put themselves on the spot by answering that? Go ahead. I think we're just sad. Yeah. How many of you grew up in this church? That's going to make it particularly difficult for those who have grown up here. So what's been happening in the Penn Central Conference is that we've had a number of churches that have decided they want to do their ministries together. They want to blend in some way, either by sharing a pastor or by truly blending either in a new place altogether to congregations, which is the case of Wisdom's Table and Grace that are now worshiping at Emmanuel in downtown. Um, or that one group wants to join with another group in their building and the other group will divest itself of its property. And the divestment of property has been happening a lot across the conference. Um, there's been from our largest church, which is in the York Association, 
is right on the edge of that. They have the, the largest property, I should say, the largest property and a very, very small congregation of about 12. And so they're, they're still in the process of being able to let go of something that's historically significant and, and personally very significant. For other churches, they've gone to places in between. So they've sold their building and gone to another place and continued as a congregation and then just found that they just couldn't continue. So one of the benefits of the idea of blending in some way, and sometimes blending is a little bit easier than saying merging because there are different kinds of blending. And let me just give you a couple examples and you can think about it. So in a, in a true merger, the case of Wisdom's Table and Grace, both congregations leave their buildings they come to a new place that they establish, they create a new set of constitution and bylaws, they have a, they usually call a pastor to be their pastor of that new church start, and that's what they're calling themselves, not everybody does, but that's what they're calling themselves as new church start. And the assets of both come together and they change their name, which is very significant um, because usually there isn't a sense of true blending unless there's a change of name. So that's what's happening in what's called a true merger. The partial mergers or a uh, partial blending is when one church closes and the members are welcomed into another church. So this is a case with Trinity in East Petersburg with St. Luke's and not only do St. Luke's assets come with them, but some of those are designated assets so that ministries that were very important to St. Luke's continue at Trinity. Not only that, but they might bring one of their stained glass windows, which they did, bring a stained glass window. Uh, they hang a banner in the church recognizing St. Luke's. Um, people are very aware of who some of those different people are, but there's a real sense of hospitality and welcome and eventual sense of we are one now. That's what happens usually when there's a building that both groups want to be in, a building left from one of the churches, which is this case that we're talking about. Um, the other ways are to share a pastor, which you've heard about, or to share certain ministries or to share staff. And there are churches that are experimenting with that. Um, we have had some, we had a shared pastor um, up in northern part of the conference, and that fell apart. Uh, it fell apart for very good reasons. And both of those churches are now in relationships with other churches. <laughs> it's almost like talking about people dating. You know, it didn't work very well, so they're now with others. Um, the case here is interesting because I find interesting and very hopeful because Salem was over the moon about this idea. I mean, just thrilled. And that's not often the response I get when I go and speak with a church about the possibility of joining with another congregation. So they were very, very positive. And they wanted to set up something immediately. Um, and I did give Carol three different dates. One was next week, so that's obviously not gonna work. But three different dates for a dinner where we would meet in a, like the back section of Iron Hill. For those of you who are familiar with Iron Hill, there's a back room there. Um, but in a public place where it's a neutral space, where we can have dinner, the conference will help with that, and have conversation and start talking about what this might look like. And so that's what I'm here to answer any questions about, um, see what you think. I'm very aware, no matter what we talk about, that under the surface is feeling very sad. And since there's a number of you who have grown up in this church and been here, I recognize how difficult that will be. 
Um, Hamilton Park as a church building is rather unique because as you know, it's more in a congregational style than um, others of our churches. And I can understand the attachment to the physical plant. So having given you that just like kind of dump of some information, I'm happy to answer questions because I've been dealing with these types of blending situations since I was in the Indiana Kentucky conference. So I'm happy to give examples or answer questions about how these things work. Anne? Given that Salem is in the process of calling a new pastor with the potential for merger, include us. If, if we're going forward, would we have a position on that pastor? Absolutely. Absolutely. How is that? Okay, the way it would work is that the, what we would try to um, find and do our best to find would be a bridge person who would serve in the in-between time as things come together. Um, you all here have a pastor, that person would continue to serve you. We try to find somebody to serve them in that period of time so they're not looking for a settled pastor anymore. And it's possible if this goes forward, that they'd be able to, and you'd be able to call a full-time pastor to serve that church. Um, your pastor, and I've already had a conversation with her about this, the expectation, I'll come back to the in a second, the expectation is that when a merger happens or a blending happens, a new pastor is called. And particularly since one of them is already in a search process, it would be, there could be no expectation of bringing a pastor with you without Salem having a say in that. And vice versa, Salem can't call somebody without you having a say in it. So the matter would be something that we start to do jointly and talk about jointly if you decide to go forward with your steps of exploration. Did that make sense, Anne? Okay. <laughs> yes? Okay. So the Memorial Garden is a, do you have, um, are, are ashes put in in biodegradable containers? Yes. Okay, so it's a whole space that have, would have a number of those in there. Okay. There are a number of ways to do this. Um, one way is to remove the topsoil down probably to about six inches and make a connection with one of the cemeteries, perhaps the one that's with Trinity, let's just as an example, um, and request space for those remains to be moved and create a space there. The other possibility is to talk with Salem about do they have a space where these things could be added. The challenge with Memorial is that, Memorial Garden, is that you don't know, as I know Dave's helping you with looking at the building and what might happen to the physical property, you don't know what may happen with that. And the cremains are really, really important. They need to go somewhere where people know where they are and where they can um, visit that space. And so that would be a very delicate piece that would be handled with a great deal of care and we'd see what the different options are for dealing with it. Would there be a possibility, because I had questioned this once, and the possibility would be that that was the part of the property we would not sell, and that would always be the memorial for the Hamilton Park Church. Okay. Now, the way to do that, and I don't know your property well enough, I'm sure Dave does, the, you'd have to be able to section off a piece of property um, that could have access to it that could be public somehow. So probably an easement of some kind, depending on where we're talking about. Um, and that would have to be a caveat in the sale of the property. 
So someone, anybody who's buying would have to agree that that piece remains that. Either you cut it out and get a separate deed for a little piece of property, um, or you put it in the selling agreement that that space has to be maintained and allowed for public access. So that requires some thought too about what might be possible. If it's a, is your memorial garden up against a sidewalk? Well, it's very separate. It's, it's out the door you came in and you saw that brick wall. It's behind yes. that brick wall. Okay. So it's, it's just very closed and it has the sidewalk you probably walked up and then there's an entrance. So that would be, that's the only way you can get into it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Then we'd have to take a look at that because that, that's not a large piece of property. And so by cutting it off and making it separate from the rest of your property may be difficult to do and it may not be the best option. Um, but it can be something, if everybody agreed, that would be in the sale agreement. That's another possibility. What are you thinking about? So I'm thinking having said sale, I'm just thrilled with the idea. Mm -hmm. I think we would be thrilled with the idea of somebody coming here. So I, I hear you. I hear you. Um, Salem will not leave their building. I know that. Um, it also is one of the unique properties in, in our church collection. Wisdom and grace have already made their decision. I mean, there's a possibility, I'm running through the Rolodex in my head, of Lancaster County as a whole, it's possible that you could extend an invitation to another church and see what the response is. The key would be, so we've got First Reform downtown. They're not going anywhere. Um, Faith, which is a little bit further south, very small, family-oriented church. Um, Willow Street, which is not going anywhere. <laughs> um, Trinity Mountville, um, and that's an O and A church and so forth, but it's far, or farther, I should say. Um, apostles and apostles will likely not leave their property given its size and how it was put together. So I'd have to think about that a little bit. It doesn't have to be a UCC church. You could invite a Lutheran church to come and be with you. You could invite a Presbyterian church. It's just the openness that people feel to it. Lancaster, as you know, is a very historic place. People are deeply committed to their historic structures. Um, some have more interest in moving about than others do. So that, that's a possibility. Could give it some thought. Yes. I came from New York, from Brooklyn. And we went to this. Um, we had a UCC church and the Disciples of Christ Church that was in the area wanted to join with us. And because um, they sold their building and everything. And it, it went very well for a while, but then just like what happens now, people go move and stuff. And um, we ended up, while I was down here, I came to seminary in 92, so I would go back and help the pastor um, prepare the congregation mm -hmm. to, to let it go. And uh, they let it go, but we were lucky another church bought it. And then they would meet in the parsonage because sure. they still go to the parsonage. And the last time I was there, there was a whole bunch of different churches 
that we're meeting in the foster. So it's things like that from another church, you can. And because it was a disciple church, we had communion twice a week. Sure. A month rather. Yeah. We used our way, the UCC way, and the disciples way with elders serving it and everything. Like right, that. which is usually every Sunday. And it worked very well. Disciples of Christ is a a natural partner in a sense mm -hmm. because we have a relationship with them as the UCC. There are not many disciples churches, as you know, in this in this area at all. There was um, one up oh. they, they used to worship over at uh, the Quaker Church. Do they, do they still do that? Oh, well, what's that? They used to worship over the Quaker Church. Do they still do that? Do you know? Oh, I did not know that. Okay. Yeah. No longer there. Yeah, there's a when we invite another church to come into our space, if it's another denomination, it there are other aspects that then have to be talked about because obviously the liturgy is different. Like you're doing communion two times a month instead of every Sunday with a disciples church. Um, with a Lutheran church, the liturgy is very different. And the expectation for Lutherans is the liturgy would um, fit with Lutheran sensibilities. Um, Methodist liturgy is a little different too, but with what's going on with the Methodist Church, um, that has happened. We do have UCC, United Methodist um, Churches come together. But with what's happening with the Methodists right now, they're trying to figure out whether they even stay or go or what they are. Um, Presbyterians are probably the closest when it comes to the uh, Reformed tradition, but their polity is quite different from ours. And Presbyterians don't own their own building, which is very different from the UCC. So there's a bunch of different things there that could be talked about. So, so one of the things that um, I'm thinking here is if you, if you want to see a wonderful play, Tuesdays with Maury is down in the Fulton now. And, um, and my point, my question, not my question, but my statement is, what a wonderful life ending Maury had. Mm -hmm. um, and the lessons that were learned by that. And I think with all the sadness of this situation, I think there's room to embrace a really significant and wonderful ending that is worthy not only of this building, but of the memory of all this congregation. And, and so I, I think we got to get by, I and mean, we've got to keep the sadness there. You know, Maury was sad, Mitch was sad in the interactions, you know, but the lessons that were learned the, the opportunities that were there, Maury really kind of thought this was the best time of his life, even though somebody had to wipe his ass. So, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> so, I hope we were okay. <laughs> Only you could say that in this way. <laughs> Well, let me mention this further about Salem because I met with them the other night. Um, they are, right now, their conversation is only within their council. They have not talked to the congregation about the possibility of this at all yet. Um, what they would really like is to have an opportunity to meet with your council or consistory um, just to have conversation, purely exploratory. It's no guarantee of anything. It doesn't mean that something is absolutely going to happen, 
but they want to have a conversation. They're very open to the idea of having a conversation. Um, they are also, I should note, open to a what they think of as a as a full merger in that the end game would be changing the name of the oh. church. Wow. So they are, you know, they were laughing. They're like, we could be Salem Park. You know, just immediately they're thinking, um, which I have to say is extremely rare. So it was very pleasant to hear that. But I think there's, there's nothing to lose, I'll put it this way, there's nothing to lose by having your leadership body have a meal with their leadership body and have conversation because these things do take time and they have to be, you have to be sure that it's right. And that if we're talking about a, a, a complete joining, that worship is gonna be acceptable, that the way the church governance happens is acceptable. It's not being absorbed, in this case, it would not be being absorbed by another church. And the way that St. Luke's was at Trinity. So it would be a partnership and that would be a very key piece. What do you think? Are you open to the leadership having a conversation? I'm not sure who all is on leadership, so I'm kind of like, like are, do people in general feel comfortable with that or do you want to wait for further conversation or... This is a judgment-free zone, so you're not gonna be judged regardless of where you stand on this, but just to get a sense, how many feel uncomfortable with the idea of the leadership groups meeting for a meal? Anybody feel uncomfortable? Did you want to admit? <laughs> The other piece to know is that Salem is an open and affirming church. We all go to work. What's that? We all go to work. Yes, I know. Yeah. I don't think that would be a problem. Okay. Yeah. Would you say that would be a problem? Okay. Apparently, it's not a problem for them. No. That we're not. Okay. No, and I have worked with two churches where that was a problem. Uh, the church they were going to join was not O and A, and that was a major problem. Yeah, yeah. we we consider ourselves such. Yeah, that when we did the open and affirming process, the majority of the persons voted to do that. We arbitrarily set a percentage ah. above which we were required to do. So I think the idea of whether one is open and affirming is, is as much as it was talked about then, actions as anything else. We don't have the designation, but if you're trying to sell the notion on the idea that we were, a majority of the people were in favor of that. Okay. So whether you are or you aren't, we don't have that designation, but that's what happened. Okay, that's, it's, that's always good to know because for some churches, when I tell them that the congregation that's interested in conversation is O and A, they, they can't do it. So just wanna be sure. We went through the process. Some of the people that voted against it felt we already were. They just didn't want yep. to make it Yes. So we were very open to I, and I understand what you're saying. I mean, we have, we have parishes in Penn Central that are being led by openly gay men that are not ONA churches. Very intentionally. 
and the pastor is not seeking for the church to become ONA. Yes? I have another question. Uh, how is Salem uh, financially? Are they okay? Yeah, financially they're solid for a part-time pastor, which is what they were planning to look for. So they're, they're in good condition. They're not a church that's um, balancing on the edge, put it that way. So if we would merge with them, would they then consider a full-time? Yes. If you agree, absolutely. What happened to the full-time pastor? Did, he, did that person retire, resign? Or what happened to him? Well, Jonathan Paredes is there right now as a bridge. And so he's been there for a number of months. Um, he came out of Lancaster Seminary. The person prior uh, left the church um, and is seeking position elsewhere. Left so their it was mutual. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a good decision for the church. It was a good decision. Yeah, Jonathan is um, is waiting to, I'll, put it, I'll just be blunt, he's waiting to receive a call from Connecticut, which is where he is planning to go back to. And so he's been interviewing in Connecticut. The church know, knew from the beginning that he would not be staying. So that's not only, yeah. there's no chance that that no. leadership wants to stay? No. He has to go back to his husky territory. <laughs> For those of you following the basketball. Yeah. And would the expectation be that Libby would resign and would not be a candidate for the merger? She could she could apply as a candidate, but it would be an open search. So and I talked to her about that yesterday and she said I am absolutely fine with that. She said I don't have a problem if I am how does she put it? If I am put out of a job because the church does what's best for the church. She's in a position, personally, that she has that type of freedom. A lot of clergy aren't, but she has some of that freedom. So she can be a candidate, certainly. But it, it would be, and it should be, an open search. Other thoughts? My understanding was that the movement of this, the size of this campus and so forth was to move toward releasing it. Now, if that's completely in error and you all are dug in that you want to stay in this building, then we have a different task ahead of us. We have a task of trying to find another church that might want to come here and become part of you, which is a different process. Um, this church at Salem is very open. Um, it's worth at least having a conversation, but it doesn't mean you have to go that way. However, and I know that Dave's working with you on all of this, there is somewhat of a time, some time pressure um, in terms of where you are and your resources, both human and financial. So it's a, but like I said, they, they both are, they both take time, but if you, if the majority of you, or at least two thirds majority of you, depending on your bylaws, say you want to stay in this building, then we will do our part to try to find somebody who might want to join you here. Um, if you're willing to at least talk about the possibility of going to Salem, then we can talk about that. Yes? Can you not look at both options unless you limit to, you know, the idea of merger? Can we not look at the other option? Of sharing a pastor? At the same time, of um, keeping the building and staying, looking at other congregations joining us? Yes. 
Yes, I, what I would prefer to do, just because as I think through this in terms of process, what I would prefer to do is, if people are interested in having a conversation with Salem, to do that first. Um, and then if we get a sense that leadership really doesn't feel this is the way to continue, that then we start the process of looking for someone else. And I say that because our, in terms of the conference staff, my time um, is constrained. So it's easier for me to help with going, doing one step at a time, if that makes sense, and then trying something else. How strong do people feel about staying in this building? Uh, of course, it's your neighborhood church. Yeah. Yes, it is. It is. You're absolutely right. Does the conference have any expectations of what happens to our endowment fund if we go to another church? No, it would depend on what's in your bylaws. If your bylaws has a reversionary clause, then we'd at least have to have a conversation, but I don't know that your bylaws does. Does anybody know off the top of your head? Mike? It does not. It does not. Okay. So what you do with your funds will be your decision. Fine. Yep. And that was what my life state say. Okay. That's fine. Not that a gift to the conference would be turned down, but <laughs> it's your decision. It's your decision. Yes. Mm -hmm. We spent quite a great deal of time consulting during the uh, pandemic with a consultant, Bruce Conrad. Sure, and a Bruce. One yes. of the things we were discussing at great length was to determine what our goals were, yes. you know, as a church and where do we want our mission to be. It seems to me that's going to be an important thing when we consider who we're merging with. We better talk about Absolutely. our goals and see if they're completely off where we thought our we are storm. Very good point. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And where did um, where did some of that end up landing? What are what was the understanding of your mission goals of this congregation at the end of that process? Well, one of the things we had to determine, we went to a great deal of trouble to find out who our uh, what the word I'm looking for is, you know. Uh, your wider community is in here. Yes. And uh, we at first decided young families. And we made some movements on in that. And then that just wasn't working out in for a couple of years. But nevertheless, it's, you know, whatever. I think we need to find out if we're merging with another church, what are their goals and how do they fit with our the goals that we have? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a very good point. Absolutely. You know, I imagine that would be part of the conversation that we would have. I yes. mean, you know, when we, when we met, we would talk about those things to see how well our ideas, their ideas, our goals, our missions meshed together. Yeah. Absolutely. That would be very important because if a church already has a, this is our plan for the next three years and we've already started it and it's in this direction and that doesn't fit with what you all are thinking. That won't work. This is, this is hard and I want, I want just to, you to know that I'm aware of that. That not being able to walk to your church would be an incredibly painful thing. That would be very painful. This is our reality. It's like it's like Dave said, you don't let, you don't try to run away from that grief, but you've got to hold it in the midst of this reality, which you are not alone. I mean, it's happening, it's happening everywhere, and it's deeply painful for many, many people. 
Yes, sir. I think the most basic thing that we first need to decide is whether we want to stay here and and basically it's kind of like I, I hate to use the analogy, but I'm going to use it stay in your own home or heading to assisted living or continuing a retirement community. And and I know it sounds that sounds hard, but here's the reality. It would still be independent living. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. but, statement. Um, you're right. I, I worked with a church in Pennsylvania, or Pennsylvania, in Indiana. Uh, the pastor was going to retire in five years, and the church had about five years left. And they said, they decided as a body, we're going to spend everything we have in the next five years to do whatever we can for the people who are here or the people right around us. And that's what they did. And then they closed. So they agreed to stay there right up to the very end. Um, it meant that, and part of that was because their pastor was deeply beloved and they didn't want to lose their pastor, okay? That was a choice they made which worked for them. Um, your point about stewardship is very well taken. I mean, when I look at this, when I look at this campus and think about the number of people and the amount of very hard-earned money that's gone into building this place and keeping it going for as long as it has, you do have a stewardship responsibility. Now, the question then is, what is that responsibility? Is it to keep it as it is with whoever's willing to stay here uh, until we can't anymore, like you said, um, or is it to take what this building could provide in terms of resources, both human and financial, and take it somewhere where it will have a wider reach. I've seen churches do both, or one of, one of them, I should say, not together, but 
that's something that you all have to think very carefully about and what you're willing to do. I will say this, that churches that come together and do it well, okay, like St. Luke's and Trinity or Grace and Wisdom Table, find that there's an entirely new spirit that emerges because they have new voices and new people and they feel like they're doing something constructive in the face of a time when talking about church decline is very depressing. I mean, it really is. It works on each of us who come to a church and it works on me when I go to my home church in Ithaca and I sit down and I look behind me and there's only 15 people behind me in a church that used to be full of 600 people. So it works on us, right? And so there are benefits also to the possibility of new life. What's that? Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought there was someone else here. <laughs> That's fine. Need another voice. But I don't need to. I don't need to keep belaboring the point. I think you've heard a lot of what you need to hear. Are there are there other comments or questions you want to put out there? The other thing to be aware of is if you do decide to go forward with um, a blended church, either there or here, there will be people who will leave, regardless. There will be people who will not drive to Salem. Mm -hmm. And there will be people who will see that if another church comes here, it's so different, it doesn't feel comfortable anymore. So that's a reality either way. Unless you stay, <laughs> then it's just you're here, you all know each other, and you're where you've been. Could this be split up, like keep this for what's in here, move it over to Walking Chapel, and have this place as a different congregation, as have this congregation put out the of this chapel? There are churches that have done that, absolutely. There are churches that have done that. So, in, for example, since you have a chapel, and it will hold all of you, I assume, okay, um, you could put, you could either put the church up um, for sale with a lease back that you lease the space, but the rest of the space is available to another congregation and you put that limit on it, it needs to go to a church body. Um, you can do that, churches have done that. Um, that's definitely a possibility. Or you hold on to the property, you move yourselves over there and you put it out there that you've got space that you're willing to rent for likely not very much because most churches that need new space don't have a lot of funds mm -hmm. unless they're tied to a specific denomination um, that you have a space that you're willing to do that with. The one piece I'll just say, there's one caveat to that. If you sell the building and you lease back space in the chapel, um, you will have no say over what happens in this space, and including what the front of the church looks like. Mm -hmm which sometimes can be, uh, not sometimes, often is very difficult for people who've been part of the church. Because somebody's gonna come in here from another tradition, the first thing you're gonna do is remove the communion rail. That's usually the first thing that goes. And, yeah, right. So lots of different pieces here, lots of different pieces. So more conversation is obviously necessary, and there's different ways to go about doing that. You can go ahead and we can set up this dinner among leadership, and after that, you could also have um, a gathering where you can break into small focus groups and have conversation with each other about what the experience was like, how you're feeling about things, because with a congregation of this size, I would hope that you'd be able to get to a place of consensus about what happens next.
Um, there's no guarantee of that, but that would be ideal. Although you, you will have to vote at some point. Anything else? Sue. Sue? Sue. Assuming that we'll go ahead and have the two leadership groups get together, is it possibly before that happens for um, people to recommend or give questions or things they would want to know about? Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, I would hope that your leadership should make note of all of those things and should be able to have that with them when they come to the meeting. Okay. That's not okay to you, Carol? Cool. I'd like to say a little something. Okay. And if, if you do have the dinner to collect a list of questions that people have, they want to ask. I just want to say something, not to uh, belay uh, this meeting, but um, Pastor Bushnell was good enough, gracious enough to provide consistory and several members of the congregation with a book called uh, Gone for Good. Um, we've had a lot of discussion about the importance of this building, uh, this campus to us, and it's really, the, the, the book is meant for congregations that are going to divest themselves of, of the property. But I see it as important um, that we make really clear, deliberate decisions, even if we decide we're going to stay here. And that is, um, you don't want to wait to the, to the last minute and then decide we need to get rid of this property. And then it goes, and, and it's a play on wood, words. It goes for a use that is not for good. You know, a developer comes in and turns it into something to enrich themselves as opposed to using the building for the good of the community, uh, the good of the neighborhood and so forth, maybe turning it into a neighborhood center that has a preschool and community groups can come in and so forth. Um, so to that end, I think once everybody has had a chance to read that book, um, we'll get together, um, discuss our thoughts. Uh, the, I found the book very helpful already, and I'm only about halfway through it. Um, get together and come up with a mission statement um, that reflects our values, what we care about, uh, to ensure that if it comes time for us to do something with this building, that we use those, it, it's sold or it's used for a purpose that reflects our legacy, our, our values. Um, so at some point, just to put this on your radar, we will come back to you um, with a mission statement that we would ask you to, uh, to consider and vote on. Uh, very likely that whole process will involve uh, getting your thoughts uh, on also what you feel should go into that mission statement. We don't usually. Okay. I mean, we, we did pray. We prayed it during the service, okay. but we can pray it twice, certainly. Okay. And we prayed to start. Oh, we're probably going to hold hands. Oh, debts, debts and debtors. Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. So we're adjourned.